adventurers, welcome back. Sit down, have a drink, and let me tell you the tales of Robin Hood. Or rather, the tales of how we got from the original ballads to the story that we have today. A current one that I have right now, this is my copy right here, this is Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. And this whole quest of figuring out exactly how we got from this, from the original ballads, has been very interesting, and I would love to share that with you all right now. I must say that rereading this uh, over again, because I think I read this back, way back when I was when I was but a wee little lad, and I remember reading this, but reading it once again, I had just fallen in love with this again, because reading this has kind of, it, it seems to shatter the misconceptions, conceptions, yeah, that's a word, conceptions, the misconceptions that people have about the medieval period, because I don't know why this is, or this happens, because we have this idea, at least some people have, that the medieval period was a uh, just back-breaking work, it was hard labor, no fun, the food was tasteless and bland, there was no free time, there was no, like, like there was no color, no merriment, nothing, and yet it was like, you know, people are still human beings. You know, like, they, they want to go and have free time so they can spend time with loved ones. They can play games. They want food to taste well. They want all these things that we want to have, like, joy in, in life. And just reading this kind of hammers home again, like, you know, that life was colorful and vibrant. And there was just the average day could find joy in everything. And I would love to read the, the preface of the book right here, which I think is the, the great summary of figuring out what to expect when you read this. So, you who so plod amid serious things that you feel it shame to give yourself up even for a few short moments to mirth and joyousness in the land of fancy, you who think that life hath naught to do with innocent laughter that can harm no one, these pages are not for you. And it immediately sets the tone of like, guys, Buckle in, we're going to have a fun, rollicking adventure here. So, let's get into this stuff here. So, to begin this, I will say, kind of propose the question to you, how much of the story of Robin Hood do you know? Because, you know, there, we seem to, the, the average person who know, like, certain specific beats that happen in the story that seem to be commonplace that we would all know of. Uh, I have a section right here. Sorry, I have my computer and my notes up here to help me out with this, so bear with me here. But I noticed that we have sort of like a fundamental basic section. And I sort of have the camera up like this so that I can put a list right here. We're going to put fundamental basics right here. We have, he lives in Sherwood Forest. He has a band of merry men. He robs from the rich and gives to the poor. There is a sheriff of Nottingham who tries to capture him. And, you know, but he is very... Wit and charm, he is able to elude capture every single time. So those are like the basic beats if you want to tell the story, or at least that I have devised right here, that that is pretty much what the story of Robin Hood is basically about. There we have now an expanded selection, which a lot of people incorporated, and I personally think it helps add to like the whole flavor of the story right here, but it's not necessarily needed per se, and they are is specifically events of an archery tournament for a golden arrow. Yeah, necessarily not needed, but you know, a lot of people know about it. Uh, generally there is about a hanging taking place in Nottingham Square, but a rescue occurs to prevent that. Uh, you have uh, the addition of the Lady Love of Marion, which you know I think a lot of people are a fan of. And of course we have the scheming of Prince John for the throne and the expected return of King Richard. These all, Corbett I definitely, you know, adds a thing to, to the main story of Robin Hood, but, you know, you can tell the basic story as needed without them. So, we have our basic lists of things that kind of happen in the story. Here's the question. How much of this, what we think and generally assume to be part of the story of Robin Hood, how much of that actually holds up to the original written records or the closest records that we seem to find? How does that hold up? Well, interestingly, there's quite a bit that in the original records that actually stays quite faithful throughout the entire time. And, of course, there's quite a bit that changes, and we're going to get into this here. 
the first reference that we have to a Robin Hood uh, written down for us anywhere is in the year 1377. And that is in William Langland's uh, work, uh, Pierce Plowman, which is very fascinating and probably deserves its own video by itself, but I may not get to that. But the basic, but what I can say is try to look up Pierce Plowman like summation or summary, and you'll get an idea. If any of you are familiar with Pilgrim's Progress and how our, how the protagonist there kind of goes off an adventure and meets these interesting allegorical characters, it's pretty much, very much like that. In, in that, that story, he meets reason and sloth and pride and, you know, goodwill, duh, do good, do better, do best. The interesting trio there, you know, like, very interesting characters. Look it up. But, so in 1377, you know, that's our first reference to it. It's a very brief mention in that, that work right there. We have a certain lazy priest who mentions that, I may not know my pater, but I know the rhymes of Robin Hood. And it's just that little brief sentence right there that people are like, okay, so apparently there are certain collections of works about Robin Hood, or at least word of mouth has spread around, so that there has been a certain Robin Hood that by 1377, when it was written, if people were to read that, they would know, okay, I know what you're talking about, Robin Hood. So there has been some, you know, infamy coming about about this character that he has some recognition for, among people. As far as the timeline is concerned, it seems a little bit of a gap between what we normally think of Robin Hood taking place of and when our first record of. Because, you know, it says it's written in 1377, and generally we think of Robin Hood taking place during the time of the Third Crusade, you know, waiting for, you know, Richard to return, which takes place from 1189 to 1192. So, you know, so roughly speaking, you know, like 1200, so now we're at 1377, that's over at least 150 years removed. You know, okay, we, I'm pretty sure we can, you know, travel that a couple years, you know, for, for, for Robin Hood character to get, to gain traction with legends and stories so that they're eventually able to collect together so they can write, write it down. But, you know, like 150 years, you know, it's up for debate there. Next in our timeline, we go through the through the 1400s, you know, like 1377, we're in the 1400s, these ballads kind of seem to get collected together, and by the end of the 1400s, or if you want in a round number, say around 1500, we get what's called a jest of Robin Hood. And this is the very first, uh, as far as written work that we know of, of uh, like original, you know, original, you know, as far as we know, ballads that were composed of, taken of Robin Hood, and somebody decided to compile them together to make some sort of a cohesive story. And the jest is kind of interesting. The, it's sort of, it's made up of called eight fits. It's spelled like this, but I had to look it up. It's, it's pronounced fit, and basically it means a portion of a poem or song. Now these fits that we have sort of are smaller portions in like these greater tales, shall we say. So we have like the first tale that takes place. We have what's called the Sorrowful Night, where Robin Hood tries to help a knight who has been fallen on hard times and is losing his land. And Robin decides to help him out with a loan that he needs to make to the Abbot of St. Mary's. And then we have like sort of like an Act 1 and an Act 2. And so like this is Fit 1, Fit 2. And then that is like the first part of like the first tale right there. Then this, the second tale begins, and so we have like, so we have like Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. And so all of these fits together make up these tales that, you know, are kind of all weaved together. I will read a little bit of the uh, fifth fit here. Let me see if I can pull up tab here. Yes, Jest of Robin Hood. So this is the very, very end of the sixth fit. I will give a little summation of the fifth one that leads up into the sixth of what it's all about. Basically, the Sheriff of Nottingham uh, is being a little bit troubled that he's trying... Robin Hood is being a thorn in his side right now. And so he has devised, I will arrange an archery tournament for a golden arrow. And that will lure Robin Hood in so I can capture him. And of course, Robin Hood goes to the tournament and wins, but, you know, it's an ambush. So in trying to escape, Little John and other people are like wounded, so it's a bit of a harrowing escape trying to flee. And 
They can't really escape to Sherwood Forest. Well, Sherwood Forest, we'll get to that later, but they, they can't escape home, wherever that may be. And so they flee to the castle of the Sorrowful Knight that I mentioned previously, where they had helped and how become friends. And because of uh, this knight, known as Sir Richard of the Lee, because he has helped Robin Hood kind of escape, now the sheriff is kind of after him now. So while the sheriff has gone to arrest Sir Richard, the lady of the castle, Sir Richard's wife, goes to Robin Hood and his men pleading for help to go and rescue him. And so, of course, you know, Robin Hood's men are like, you know, uh, this man, you know, helped us in our time of need, need, so we'll go off and help him. And so I will go ahead and read this last section right here. It's in Old English. I'm going to go see if I can put the words up here so you can follow along. I'm going to read a kind of a translation so it will not really rhyme per se, but you will kind of get the idea because when you look at some of the words, you're like, okay, what the heck does that mean? What are these words? So here we go. His men drew out their bright swords that were so sharp and keen and laid on the sheriff's men and drove them down forthwith. Robin leapt to that knight and cut into his bond, and took him in his hands about and bade him by him stand. Leave thy horse thee behind, and learn for to run. Thou shalt with me to Greenwood, through mire, moss, and fen. Thou shalt with me to Greenwood, without only lying, till that I have got us grace of Edward, our comely king. And so, just... Just off the bat, right there, you know, there's those whole rhyming stuff that you that you can see that like it has that you could easily see someone just either just in poetic verse or you know someone could easily put this to song. It'll be a fun time where you get to this whole rhyming thing. But I want you to you probably notice something. That very last verse right there, of Edward, our comely king. Yes. Now we get into some of the differences that take place. So which Edward are we talking about that it mentions in the jest? Uh, going on the basis of our first mention of him in 1377, if we're, the general consensus is to believe that, okay, we're around this time frame, you know, like when we begin the beginning of the compilation there, then we believe it's to be one of the first three, Edward the first, Edward the second, or Edward the third. And there is another thing to, to think about in this, is that, this is also around the time frame getting to the Hundred Years War. Because, you know, specifically uh, 1415, that is the Battle of Agincourt. So very infamous of where the longbow happened to be used that defeated the French, per se. So if this is the time frame where the longbow is becoming very prominent in England and becoming a, a favorite pastime of people, that people would want to see expertise in people using the longbow, this would generally fit around the time frame a little bit more than, say, the time of the Third Crusade. Because, you know, while definitely bows were being used, you know, in warfare, it wasn't generally popularized so much as it was in the specific time of the Hundred Years' War, where all of a sudden the longbowmen, or, you know, the yeoman class, got to have its own, got to have its own heyday and recognition that they were great archers and that we had great archery tournaments, per se. So... You bounce it out like, okay, this does seem to make more sense that it would probably generally seem to be around the time of Edward than, you know, say, Richard Lionheart. I got my notes right here, so, okay, you go King Richard and, you know, his brother Prince John. If it's, time the, if it's during the time of Edward, okay, well, then that's out. Uh, unfortunately, there is no mention of a Marian or any form of uh, lady love that Robin has, so I know I, I feel deeply hurt. But, you know, there's no mention there. Uh, Sherwood Forest is now, as far as the ballot's original concerned, he is from Barnsdale rather than Sherwood Forest. So, okay, so that's changed right there. We do have a sheriff that is trying to catch him, but it's not of Nottingham, per se. It says it's the sheriff of Yorkshire, or Yorkshire, the Shire of York. So that's been changed right there. We do still have a band of merry men, and even though specifically we mentioned Little John, was part of the group, so that was that's part of the very beginning. The robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, that's kind of a little bit up for debate, whether you consider that, because, okay, we have the very first reference of we have this knight who is in need, trying to repay a loan that he does not have the money for, 
and then Robin decides to go and give him the money to help him, you know, pay his debts that he feels has been wronged. Do you feel like, okay, robbing the rich, giving to the poor? No, we have, like, one instance of him giving to the poor, and then ironically, the monk that has had the debt paid to him to fulfill the debt that the knight needs to owe, he has been uh, uh, kind of, you know, captured, per se, on the way back by Robin Hood and invites him inside, and he asks him questions, and of course the monk pleads, you know, man of the cloth, and he claims poverty, but he finds this huge loan on his money, and so he relieves him of this terrible burden that, you know, this monk should have to have to bear. So, robbing from the rich, giving to the poor, this is kind of like the only instance we have him, there's like nothing really else, it's more like the rollicking adventure of the tournaments and escaping from the sheriff, so that's kind of up to debate for what people have. So, that this is kind of what we have originally, you know, that we have these changes, but yeah, we have the story what we have now, like we have the one that I have, like, okay, so how do we get from the jest to this, per se? Well, let's go down the timeline of changes and additions that happened into the story of Robin Hood. Around 1500 is when the sort of, like, the jest came to be, you know, compiled together for us, for our, you know, enjoyment and viewing pleasure. It also happens to be around this time that the changes start to take place. Because up until this point, Robin Hood is a yeoman. That he, he is just of, he is of the working class. You know, like, the average, ordinary guy who can, you know, inspiring people to do good just by himself. And, yeah, the kind of certain tales that we have, you know, like, he is sort of like a, a lesser lord that has been robbed of his titles by, like, the sheriff. And he is now forced to live in the woods. How did this happen? Well... We believe that the time of the Tudors uh, helped out with this because Robin Hood became very popular specifically in the court of King Henry VIII. And we have a specific record written down for us that in 1510, he and about 11 of his fellow members of the court right there snuck into the Queen's chambers dressed as Robin Hood and the, the Merry Men right there. What exactly they were doing, I don't know, but it's funny that we have this, you know, mention for us, you know, that if it was so influential that the king himself was, you know, being inspired by Robin Hood, then you can begin to see how it might be around this time that the changes start to take place, where like, well, if the, the king is now taking interest, well, you know, and now it's just, it's no longer just a, just a, just a common-born man, like, no, no, it, it has to be a more of a lesser lord, you shall say, you know, it has to be has much more nobler stock here, of better breeding than, you know, like, the, the common peasants, shall we say. Again, I can't 100% say, you know, this, you know, like, brought it about, but it's, you could see how this, the transition could have been taking place, because by the, kind of by the end of the 1500s, by, about, by, by the 1600s there, or the 17th century, centuries and hundreds have always messed me up, by the end of the 1500s, we kind of have the gentrification, shall we say, of Robin Hood, where there has been quite a few changes that takes place that there have been many people associating that Robin Hood is now of the, the nobler heritage rather than yeoman. Right, you know, that there are still you know, yeoman and noble versions of Robin Hood, but you know, there has been enough out there that people are familiar with this sort of uh, gentry version, shall we say. Uh, Robin Hood. Interestingly enough, around the time of King Henry VIII, we have, in the year 1521, we have John Major in his Historia Majoris Britannia, Britannia, you know, however you pronounce that right there. This is the first mention of the stories of Robin Hood beginning to mention to take place during the time of King Richard and his brother John. Now, do we know, per se, that because John Major had more information than we did at this point, and that, like, he knew some, some records that, you know, believe that it took closer to King Richard, rather as opposed to, like, King Edward, or was this, you know, you know, it has been hypothesized that sometimes this was part of the gentrification process that in Tong Tong took place with King Henry, that in order to make him less ruffian-like, because he is 
uh, and the Jets a, a bit quick-tempered and prone to rash decisions and easy to come to blows, that they wanted to make him more noble, shall we say, and so he only robs from the rich, those who deserved it, and he, you know, he's philanthropic in giving to the poor, and you know, he rises up to against the oppression of you know, like certain people who oppress others right there. So again, is it because he had access to certain records that we didn't have, or if it's just he was trying to help spin the tail to help better suit others? Again, we don't know 100%, but I'd like to think that it took place during the time of King Richard, but if I'm going to be honest, you know, the likelihood of it around that time, or at least the Robin Hood that we know of, probably didn't. There probably was a Robin Hood, because I found out that apparently Robin Hood, or Robert Hood, or Robert Hudson, or just Robinson around that time, was actually quite a very common name. But then again, okay, which ones were actually, like, more outlaws? Is it, what, what deeds did they do? How, what records do we have? You know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint out. We do have a, quite a few possible candidates, but again, not specifically in that timeline of the Third Crusade that we're looking for, but we'll get to that later. While on the subject of things changing in the stories of Robin Hood here, I just need to bring up the, uh, the, sub, the, the topic here, that it is possible that, you know, certain legends and tales of Robin Hood happened earlier, per se, but, you know, the first time of record that we have takes mention during the time of King Edward does beg to raise the question, did certain people writing these stories and ballads, did they move up the timeline, shall we say, so that it took place during, you know, back then, present day, so that when people were telling stories, like it was happening fresh, here and now, like it's, oh, it's just, just right, you know, you know, go down the road, and go into the woods and you, you can probably see Robin Hood right now. You know, because the, the, the closest reference that I can probably give is in our day and age, we have Spider-Man. A very popular uh, folk hero in our day and age, shall we say. And from the iterations from we have from the very beginning of the comics to even the comics we have now and even the cinematic portrayals that we have, the... Spider-Man story, shall we say, is always moved up to what is then present day. You know, from even from the cine, from for the movies, you know, we having like Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland. Those movies take place then like here and now. They they, they generally don't take place back when like the first time we hear the comics taking place. You no, know, like they move it up so that it's like it's all you know current timeline. It is. You know, it's just something to, you know, be aware of that, like, it's possible that this could have happened as people were like, let's make it during the time frame of our current king, King Edward. So just, you know, something to think about right here. So just to recap here, from the 1500s to the 1600s, we kind of have the gentrification of Robin Hood taking place, which does seem to kind of get some traction here. The plausible high, uh, possible idea of it taking place during Richard the Lionheart, has been brought forth, whether how well that stuck per se, you know, during that time, you know, it's difficult because, you know, later on, certain people would catch on to that idea and popularize that, but, you know, at the initial onset, you know, we don't know, but, you know, the Robin Hood becoming more of the nobler stock, that one definitely seemed to stick around, and, of course, when Robin Hood is now a lord, well, then you kind of need to have a lady, and now this is the transition of when Marion comes into play. So, if we're going to go talk about Marion, we kind of have to go back a little bit, all the way back to the very beginning. The first, we believe, probable cause of the Marion being addition to the story comes in 1283. I know, that's a bit before now. In so 1283, we have Adam de La Hale, I believe I pronounced that correctly, and he, his work also French, oh boy, here we go. Les Jeux de Robin et Marion. I think I pronounced that correctly. But, so yeah, this is the reference of a Robin and a Marion together. This is no connection to Robin Hood, per se, at least yet. It's just a story of a shepherdess named Marion and her lover, who just happens to be named Robin. Now, the thing is, as we move along, you know, getting to the 1300s, 
the festivals that people have during the medieval period, specifically the what we call the May Games. In certain traditions, the the so some French areas, they have the idea of having sort of a sort of queen of the May Games. Again, I say queen per se, as in you know she doesn't like rule over it. She's not like a person who organizes the event, but a very you know prominent character that shows up as a person of interest in the games per se. And this, but well, I'm going to call it Queen of the May Games, you know, to you know for everyone for here. But this character was known as Marion, and this original character was a bit more uh, body wanton. Uh, troll-like character, rather than the uh, lady that we come to know and love. Uh, we believe that along with the gentrification process of Robin Hood, that when they were looking for a lady, they found this character, and of course they had to bring her into nobler uh, position as well. But in while certain areas have these traditions of having a again like queen of the games in May. In certain of the English traditions, sometimes we have a, again, for lack of a better term, a king of English names whose name was Robin. Again, originally not really of Robin Hood status per se, but as the legends of Robin Hood became popular, it was easy to incorporate, like, well, hey, we're in springtime, the festivals are here, we're off to show, you know, sportsmanship, whatever. Why not have this character be Robin Hood? And so Robin Hood kind of became incorporated as sort of like the person of interest in the May Games in certain regions. So whether the you know slow blending of cultures, you could probably see like well, if some areas have like a king, some areas have a queen. Maybe they belong together. You know they're you know as a couple. You know who those. But you know as once we get to the 1500s and the gentrification takes place. I believe this is probably the easiest, you know, hanging fruit available of people trying to find a lady love. And then, of course, they, you know, bring her to be like, okay, so she's not more of the, uh, uh, loose character, shall we say. She is, uh, uh the noble daughter of some lord. Uh, some people, I believe, are like, like, Huntingdon is the, the I think, the, the one that, uh, stays around for, for a bit. But that's when, uh, Marion comes into play, or so around the 1600s as well. She's not the only addition. We have the addition of Alan Adale and Friar Tuck around this time as well. So we got more members uh, by particular naming, at least adding to the band of Merry Men. The next sort of date of interest that we have moving along the timeline will become around the 1800s per se. So, you know, things that, let's say, the, the story of Robin Hood, Robin Hood has been fermenting a little bit. And then Coming up to 1800, specifically 1819, we come to Sir Walter Scott and his book uh, Ivanhoe, which was very popular and even still is. And you know, while that you know is kind of you know more based on sort of like the knightly aspects of you know chivalry and you know jousting, you know, but it does kind of still still dwell on the idea of okay, like righting wrongs. And standing up for what you believe in. It also happens to mention specific characters like a Robin of Loxley, a Friar Tuck, and an Alan Adale in the book right there. So you know, like further, you know, reinforcing into the readers' minds that Robin Hood took place during the time frame of King Richard and the Third Crusade here. And finally, we get to the 1880s when we get to Howard Pyle himself. And we have the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. And uh, currently, this is you know, probably the most easily, readily available uh, one to get a hold of. I don't know if it's my, well, I will say currently it's my favorite, but then of course, I think it's like the only one that I have right now. I mean, there's probably Sir Walter Scott's version of it, there's probably other available renditions of the Robin Hood story, but I think this is probably the most popular, the most readily available, the most well-known, and I really enjoy it. And if there is just one, you know, point to, like, if there's anything you get out of this entire video, is that go find and get yourself a copy, uh, purchase it if you need to, otherwise go to the library, if there's a friend who has a copy, see if you can borrow it from them, and just read a bit of it, because it is, it is a fun time right here. 
This book, I believe, does a fair job at trying to be truthful to the original source material and also trying to incorporate some of the best aspects of the later editions and renditions that have come before it to add on to it. So we have the editions of Alan Dale and Friar Tuck. We have, we have two archery tournaments here instead of one, so hey, upgrade. Uh, we have, you know, not necessarily too much dwelling on the scheming of Little John. We are kind of like wanting uh, the return of Richard a little bit. But uh, we have the additions of, of the court of kind of Queen Eleanor herself, so there's that in there. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that deals with Marion herself. We have references that, you know, like he has his sweetheart Marion, but, you know, like of actual adventures and stories with her, not enough to say, so, mm, you know, like, you know, can't have everything. But, you know, you can, you can imagine, you know, with, with, with a much, as much vivid storytelling as it has in colorful language we have here, you can imagine certain uh, stories happening takes place, which I guess is an important thing, you know, like it sparks your own imagination of like, well, what happens uh, in the in the uh, the stories and the ballads that we have. And I guess that is kind of one of the points to like kind of transition into like the cinematic portrayals that we have here is the different versions that we have wildly available because the ballads and the jests and the stories we have now have all fluctuated and changed because people have been inspired by certain things, but then wanting to change it whether to suit a certain narrative at a certain point or wanting to add on to it and make it better, make it their own. So you know, we have certain movies and uh, or even like TV shows that take place that focus on different aspects of it, you because know, we know there's themes of, you know, like standing up for injustice and trying to right the wrongs for people who cannot you know, stand up on their own. We have the idea of being using wit and your your intellect and heart to overcome challenges rather than, you know, brute force, although there is, you know, the idea of using fun archery and skill to get yourself out of situations. There's the idea of, you know, and also the like the moral dilemma of like robbing the rich and giving to the poor, you know, when do you draw the line on is that a good thing or is that not? You know, there's many different themes that kind of come up in the Robin Hood story ends, each person who wants to tell a story or make a movie can focus on certain aspects. And this will be a transition into a different area because uh, the way I gotta do this, I've gotta set this up differently. Psych! Not actually talking about the cinematic portrayals of Robin Hood right now. In editing this, I have realized that we have a good chunk of material right here that if I were to add an entire section of the portrayals of Robin Hood in the cinema, it might get really long and I'd like to keep it nice and easy for you guys. So I will make a part two to this uh, current video, which will be just the cinematic portrayals and the storytelling aspects there. I will finish this particular video of the historical side with some historical examples of Robin Hood that we have and see if there are any like compilations of matchings of what happens in the jests and records that we have of some historical references right here. So let's begin here. We are going to start in reverse chronological order. So we are going to start from the what personally I think is probably the more one that totally fits the bill of Robin Hood but it's the latest one in the sequence. It's from 1322 and we are going to work our way back closer to see if we can get to the time of King Richard and Prince John. So, as I said, 1322, this is where we have a Robin Hood who has been employed by the Earl of Lancaster. He's been known to be as part of the Earl of Lancaster and specifically the rebellion of Earl of Lancaster against King Edward II. So already we have sort of a rebellion taking place. There's a King Edward mentioned and in the Battle of Borough Bridge in 1322, uh, the Earl of Lancaster lost that particular battle. And so now the followers and adherents of the Earl of Lancaster are like in a predicament where I'm like, okay, like what do we do? Like we're now that we've lost, we're kind of basically considered traitors and treason to the king. We're basically outlaws. And however, in 1323, just one year later, after this event where this Robin Hood character seems to be an outlaw, uh, Robin Hood has shown to be 
seems to be pardoned and employed by King Edward II as part of one of his, you know, no noble men at arms. Very kind of paralleling some of the stories we have in the jest of where the king goes to the forest to find this notorious outlaw, you know, under disguise, meets Robin Hood, and then after kind of, you know, learning and becoming friends, reveals himself and sort of like pardons the Merry Men and asks Robin Hood to join his service. Quite uh, parallel to the story right there. Very interestingly enough, this also same Robin Hood, who in his time of be kind of like exile of being an uh, outlawing of the king trying to before he became pardoned, his wife joined with him, decided to come with them in the forest in exile to be together. She was named Matilda, who, according if the story is true, decided to while in exile decided to change her name for like either to, for like to be an alias to be safe or reason, but. Her name she chose was Marion. And so this one is, of all options, seems to be the most uh, probable as well. We have another character known as Robert Hood, who was living just a bit in a, time, in a little bit earlier in the time timeline, still in the same 1300s, that some people have debated to be the same person, this Robert Hood and Robin Hood. And Robert Hood right here is from Wakefield which, I don't know if you remember seeing the map that we have here of Nottinghamshire, and then we have Yorkshire right up, kind of right above it. Well, Wakefield is kind of like smack right in the middle. And so like, okay, it could fit the stories of being tied around from the Sheriff of Yorkshire that we have in the earliest records, but it could also tie into the Sheriff of Nottingham as well, going down below because it's kind of in that same area for what we have now. However, if it is the same person, so like, that's incredible, but then that means that he began his outlawing career at the ripe tender age of 53 years old. So, again, that's because we have records of this particular Robert Hood of going back earlier, so that way, if that is correct, then he would be in his 50s beginning outlaw, when normally we think of this being as a young man's game. At least, so that that's what we generally think of. Again, you know, not completely out of, you know, plausible ability, but, you know, like, generally we think so. On the one hand, we kind of want it to be the same person because it's right in the area that we need. But, you know, also like, okay, if it is, then we also have some negative effects as well. So that's Robin slash Robert, maybe same person, of Wakefield and the time of Lancasters. So that's part of that one there. Moving on, we're now going to the 1260s. So, okay, we're out of the 1300s, and now we're in the 1200s here. During what's called the Second Baron's War. The Second Baron's War? Well, that's because we had a First Baron's War, which is probably more common than what we know of. That is the time frame of when King John and his rule became so uh, tumultuous that the barons decided to rise up and revolt against them, and we had the First Baron's War. Probably back then it was just called the Baron's War, but because we had a second one, now we got to call it the First Baron's War. Uh, we have an interesting collection of people. We have Robert and John Deville. I'm assuming it's Deville. Uh, it, ironically, when I look at it, I'm, I immediately think of like Cruella Deville, but it's D-E-Y-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E, so I'm assuming you pronounce that. It's old English, maybe. Maybe I don't know how you pronounce it, but I'm going to go with Deville right here. And Robert and John are actually brothers. That's one because you know they have the same name. And so, like, okay, we have a Robert Hood and Little John. You know, like we have records of a Little John from kind of right from the beginning, that or apparently living in Barnsdale, which is from where the original records that we say Robin Hood takes you know takes place in. And very ironically, the uh, John happens to have a settlement of a mortgage regarding, I won't get into too much of the details, but this mortgage was worth 400 pounds of trying to get settled here, which parallels exactly the same amount that in the tales of the Sorrowful Knight, the knight had to pay the loan to the abbot of St. Mary's worth 400 pounds. So I'm like, 
okay, there's some now very odd coincidences in here. Maybe this is a Robin Hood. Again, like, maybe these are all different stories of Robin Hood weaving together that people are like, that are all coming together. I don't know, but it's interesting that we have another Robin Hood, but again, a little bit earlier, and, you know, it doesn't specifically tie exactly with, you know, what King John and the Third Crusade, but, you know, because it's the Second Bar Baron's War, it has a kind of footnote, so like, oh, okay, so there was a Baron's War you can extrapolate, you know, things happening in Magna Carta that, you know, was supposed to be upheld, but as now King Henry is, doesn't seem, because it should be a little bit lax on the rules, so that the Barons revolt again, and so I'm like, hey, you know, what's up? So this is another record of a Robin Hood character that, you know, definitely could possibly fit the bill here. The very first uh, Robin Hood, as, as far as like a legal text concern, is in 1226. Okay, so we're getting close to, because, you know, 1215 was when the time of Magna Carta being written. But I'm like, generally we think of its time right before King John had to write that, so we think of its 1194. But we're still in the 1200s here, but, you know, we're getting closer. And, <laughs> ironically, the only thing that we hear about this one is he was found in York. And when that person's goods were 32 shillings and 6 pence... Again, I don't know the amount of what that would be like in today, in our day and age, of how much the monetary system is, but 32 shillings and six pence were confiscated, and he became an outlaw. Like, that's about it. So, like, okay, so... However, there is one other character that I would like to discuss, and that is Robert Fitzwalter. Robert Fitzwalter was one of the barons who, in fact, one of the leaders of the revolt against then King John, who then had, was made to sign Magna Carta. So we are now actually in the time frame of King John, per se, not necessarily the time of uh, Prince, uh, Crown Prince, in the time of King Richard, who is actually king, and we're just waiting for him to arrive, but we are in actual now in the time frame of King John, and leading up to his eventual defeat and signing of Magna Carta. He was one of the bar baron leaders of that particular rebellion. And even the naming convention of Robert Fitzwalter kind of ties in with some of the uh, names that we generally associate with Robin Hood. Uh, you know, we kind of think of Robin Fitzsooth as one of the names we think, but that we kind of know that that's more like a made-up name. But, you know, Fitzwalter is kind of one of the names that we generally associate. I think of, like, that one of the titles of this noble uh, Robin character who is disposed of his lands. Which, ironically, uh, this Robert Hood was, after the, the, the rebellion here, he was forced into exile. Uh, again, this it says he went, he, he went and fled to France, per se, but it was eventually brought back. And to even more, more which weird ties in, he, the reason this whole thing got started was because his eldest daughter, Matilda, again, so it seems like we have a very common female name now, we have a very common male name of Robert or Robin, now we have Matilda, we mentioned twice here. It was in the same context of Robin Hood. His eldest daughter, Matilda, was, as the rumors are true, that was seemed to be trying to be seduced by King John, because King John had this way of trying to... with his way of with women there. And that was one of the tipping points of Robert Fitzwalter to rise up against uh, King, King John right there. So, weirdly enough, I'm like, okay, so we kind of have a character again right now during the time of King John, that could possibly be a candidate for Robin Hood, but could also be a candidate for what seems to be a lot of the father of Marion, who we have this, we have a lord who has a daughter named Matilda. We have another record of a Matilda who took on the name Marion for a disguise. So, you know, like we have all of these different historical characters that probably all brought about their own little bits into the story prominent enough that people would be hearing little snippets and stories and from different kind of different locations and different periods in time 
that as they come together and each one adds their own thing or tweaks it a little bit or they hear a certain name that matches another name, that they would all come together and we kind of get, you know, the story of Robin Hood that we get today. That, you know, like there, again, it seems like there's the biggest candidate uh, closest to the historical records of being time of Edward, but then even as we go further in time, there are a lot of characters that seem to meet the criteria of what Robin Hood seems to be. Are they all, like, little snippets of stories being compiled together, and this is what we get, like, these are the history of multiple individuals throughout history, and not that the actions of, like, one particular individual? Yeah, probably. That's probably going to be the case, but... And I kind of like it that way, that... And, and in the sense that we don't know, like, we don't know who Robin Hood is. He's just this, this phantom that, like, exists in our world. Like, we hear whispers, like, we think we might have seen him, but, like, we never know really who he is, that he is, like, he sparks our imagination, and that's kind of, that's sometimes where, like, it's probably best, at least in my opinion, that we don't know who he is. And with that in mind, you know, tying to the video that will come after this, when you have the cinematic portrayals, you know, you're kind of loose in what you have to say because there are, you know, a lot of different reasons because, you know, the, the movies and TV shows that come out, you know, they are very greatly in variety in what they decide to tell. And that concludes everything about Robin Hood. Basically, the history that we have of the timeline that we have, the historical characters that we have, how the written works came about, it's been a whole lot of fun uh, talking and discussing this and learning about it and wanted to share it with you. And I know I'm going to have a part two up eventually that will show the cinematic portrayals and storytelling aspects. So, until next time, keep a watchful eye.